He is more than a story. He is more than a comic book superhero. He is more than a symbol of hope. He represents our greatest aspirations. He is everything we think we can be. And yet, even with all the strength and all the power in all of the world, he may not be able to meet his greatest challenges and redeem his family's legacy. For he is the son of El. Chapter 27 The Teenage Invasion Kaznia did not wait long after peace talks broke down to unleash a new wave of their army of enhanced soldiers. Only days later they were annexing another neighboring state. Soon it seemed a quarter of Europe had been pulled into the war all at once. As usual, Superman and the Justice League volunteered themselves to helping the innocent bystanders escape. Clark hoped helping refugees would be enough to keep the League from being dragged into this whole ordeal. In those days, Superman and the League were depended on by refugees across the war front. Oftentimes, the Justice League was practically living out of the Javelin 17 while they helped civilians escape the invasion. The enhanced Kaznian soldiers took the Justice League's presence to be hostile. When their energy weapons proved ineffective on Superman and the other flying heroes, the soldiers were quick to pounce on them whenever the heroes came within their grasp. Working together, the Kaznian soldiers were able to boost one another into the air in their attempts to take down the heroes as they flew by. Not all of their attempts failed. Jean Jones allowed himself to dematerialize and was unaffected by a soldier who was thrust directly toward him. Jon Stewart, the Green Lantern, was not so lucky and was taken to the ground by an unexpected jolt. His escape and return to flight was uneventful, but the incident was a warning to them all. They might recover while flying by themselves, but there were times they carried vehicles full of people as they flew through the air. Clark was saddened to behold these soldiers as they persisted to engage him, looking for a fight. Landing on the ground, there were times he saw them up close. Many had cybernetic limbs and were obviously drugged to the point that their eyes bulged while they charged at him. His heart ached with pity for what Vandal Savage had done to them. Finding some downtime on the Javelin 17, he spoke to Barry Allen, the Flash, about his sympathies for this child army that Kaznia had created. Barry felt the same way. He'd recently been thinking about child development. It's some pretty serious stuff. These kids will be suffering for the rest of their lives. Clark sighed. He saw it too. No kidding. It's heartbreaking. I've been mentoring my nephew lately and I think about this stuff all the time. How do you have a nephew, Barry? You're an only child. Oh, I mean Iris's nephew. Though technically he's my nephew now. When did you two get married? Oh shoot, yeah. Last year actually. Sorry I forgot to mention it. Things were pretty crazy with the whole election thing going on. And I would have loved to have invited you, but for the most part, Iris's family doesn't know that I'm the Flash. And some of them are Luther voters, so I figured better not stir the pot. No worries. Understood. But what's this kid's name? Wally. Yeah. He's a good kid. Like I was saying, I don't want to mess him up by being a bad mentor and traumatizing him. How do you possibly think you'd traumatize him? Well, you know that speed force I was telling you about? Yeah, the energy that makes you move so fast. I wouldn't phrase it that way, but yeah, that's just the point. The speed force is hard to describe. I try telling friends about it, the ones that know I'm the Flash, but most of them don't quite pick up what I'm laying down. But Wally, this kid totally gets it. So I kept telling him more about it, like how it warps time and how it moves through matter. And so like, the two of us start experimenting with the speed force and um, yeah, so now he has it too. He what? Wally has the speed force. You mean he can run as fast as you? Well, not that fast, but I bet he could get there. Most of what I do is about my mental state, you know? Otherwise, it's just too much to handle, and synapses can't do what I do. Clark wasn't so sure he understood what Barry was saying, but brought the conversation back to Barry's nephew. And you're worried Wally will somehow be traumatized or hurt by the speed force? No, that's not it. It's just that we've seen a lot of pretty bad stuff doing what we do. And he's just a kid. I don't want him to get hurt. And even if he isn't hurt, I don't want him to resent me like Nightwing resents Batman. Well, Barry, I've done some mentoring of my own. And I've worried over what might go wrong. But I can promise you, you'll be surprised by how well he can manage just fine on his own. 
I don't know if anyone in the Justice League was ready for their powers, but we've all done just fine. Even Nightwing. Hmm. Thanks, big guy. I appreciate hearing it. The two of them stood up to return to the battlefront. Just as the Flash dashed away in a blink, an unusual crackling sound grew progressively louder. Finally, with a pop and a small flash of light, Clip Plixum, the mischievous imp, appeared right in front of Clark, wearing a tiny green suit and bowler hat. Clark was startled by the sudden arrival of the trickster. The last thing he needed was the level of chaos Clip Plixum would add to their already tedious situation. The tiny man stood hovering in the air at eye level. Unfurling a scroll of paper, he took a deep breath and began proclaiming as he read, By the doctrine of Argo, under the dominion of Candor, it is arbitrated that... Clip Plixum, don't get any clever ideas. Excuse me, sir. Is that a command? I rather like clever ideas. What are you doing here? Whatever does it look like I'm doing here? Some kind of mischief would be my guess. Well, I regret to inform you that my existence is not all fun and games. Honestly, I am disappointed I haven't heard from you for so long. I don't regret it at all. Oh, you don't have to be rude about it. I would rather you just leave and go back to where you came from. Actually, this is one of those few occasions I don't have to do what you say, and neither of us get what we want. I have to read this, and though I don't have to read the whole thing, I must complete the entirety of the first sentence. Fine. Read your sentence. Oh, I will. And you mustn't interrupt. All right, I won't. And to believe you used to call me Mr. Mixoplick. How the tables have turned. But Plixum, read the proclamation. Fine, I will. Now where was I? Clip Plixum grabbed the scroll floating next to him out of the air. Hoisting up his posture, he straightened the glasses on his face, which only seemed to appear and disappear for the sake of being adjusted. Ahem. By the doctrine of Argo, under the dominion of Candor, it is arbitrated that Argo's emissary to Krypton is hereby repleted in full accordance to the Charter of Krypton and the House of El. All debts associated with Candor's endeavor are duly paid through bridal tribute to the House of El and for the discretion of the House of El. All parties conjoined shall henceforth constitute the patrilineal rule of the expansion of Krypton and dominion of Candor. Redistribution by said parties is furthermore delineated by... Clip Plixum. Yes, sir. That was more than one sentence. Yes, sir. I was only going to read one sentence, but that was before you told me to read the proclamation. And I would hate to disobey you. He took on a narrow smile that didn't translate to his eyes. Clark ignored his malicious expression. Is that all there is to it? Well, I'm not sure. I do believe this usually happens on Krypton. I've never read this particular doctrine before. I expected to find you at the palace up north. That's where she was, at least. Who? The emissary. Which emissary? Argo's emissary to Krypton. Were you not listening? Do I have to read it again? It's in the first sentence. No, I, um, you said she's at the palace? Well, yes, not exactly, but to that effect. All right, Kaplixum, I'll take it from here. Go back to where you belong. So rude, and you absolutely are mispronouncing my name. Just go. Clark was relieved to see him vanish in the same flash he had appeared in. Yet a small sense of dread clung to him. Not even bothering to tell the others where he was going, Clark bolted to the north, to his family's ancient summer home. The door hung wide open. Inside, the blue crystal pendant that Clark had once used to attune himself to the earth was missing from its mount. The hallway to the right of the altar had been left ajar, its doors also open. Someone had been there, yet it appeared they had already left. After finding the Crystal Palace's doors ajar, Superman didn't return to the European battlefront that day or the next day. Instead, Clark went to work at the Daily Planet. There, he would have the resources to investigate if this emissary had made any waves in the news. It was an uneventful effort until Jimmy Olsen came into the office. Hey Clark, did you see that Supergirl video? The what now, Jimmy? Oh, it's great! You gotta see this! Jimmy took over Clark's computer at his desk to pull up a video. While it played, Jimmy went on. Some cosplayers were gathering at a nightclub and were being harassed by these drunk dudes? But this one girl in a Superman outfit was like a black belt or something, and she just dusted this dude! Check it out! The video's action wasn't long. In a clip of a dance floor full of people dressed as their favorite superheroes, a large man appearing not to be dressed for the event started groping a young lady in a Wonder Woman costume when her friend stepped in to help her. 
The friend was a brilliant blonde teenager dressed in a shimmering blue gown, a red cape, and wearing the emblem of the House of El, emblazoned on her chest. In a single blow, she knocked the man out of the frame of the video. She was a little surprised by her own effectiveness. Clark could see this girl was no cosplayer. She was wearing the blue pendant from the palace. Jimmy kept scrolling the page. But here, check it out. It looks like she's some foreigner and these girls met her at HeroCon in Danva City. There were a series of photos going back through the day, beginning with the girls all meeting each other and eating lunch from a hot dog stand. I had this dream one time where a genie granted me a wish and I wished for a supergirl. I gotta admit, I always hoped she'd be real. Lois Lane had walked up behind them, overhearing their conversation. She wasn't impressed. Why are you creeping on a teenage girl's profile page? Jimmy, what are you getting Clark into? Oh, come on, Lois. You don't see the potential for a story? I mean, listen to this. Jimmy leaned in to read off the screen. She doesn't speak English, but we connect through the love of superheroes. I mean, really? You don't see how this piece just writes itself? Clark hoped the story wouldn't gain any more traction than it already had. Whoever this woman was, he had to find her before anyone else learned where she had come from. I don't know, Jimmy. I'm siding with Lois on this one. It's not really story worthy. It's a feel-good story, Clark. People need to read something uplifting these days. Lois had another perspective. We're not arguing with that, Jimmy. It's just, maybe there are other feel-good stories that don't involve leering at teenage girls? Jimmy didn't pursue the idea any further. When the matter was settled, Clark excused himself, went to the roof of the building, and flew to Danver City. While they'd been talking, he'd been doing exactly as Lois was telling Jimmy not to do. He had found the identity and address of the young lady posting the videos and pictures. Within the hour, he was descending on a suburban backyard, where he found the same group of girls he'd seen in the pictures. They were partially dressed in their costumes, except for the emissary he sought. She was adorned in her full regalia. The group circled around her in adoration. The young ladies felt the wind stirring around them before looking up to notice Superman's approach. Until this moment, the girls had not let themselves believe that their new friend could be any more than a lost foreigner with off-the-charts charisma and some incredible self-defense training. Seeing Superman in the backyard changed their whole perspective on their past 24 hours. The young lady in red and blue was taken aback when she first looked up and beheld Superman. She shrank in dread of the punishment she expected. Keeping her head bent forward and eyes cast down, she stood up and walked forward to meet Clark. Kneeling before him, she had her own mandated proclamation. When she spoke, it was the same language his parents' hologram spoke in. Deep inside, Clark knew this language. Lord of El, I am Kara, daughter of Zarel. By decree of the Order of Argo and the Dominion of Kandor, I offer myself to our common house as emissary to Krypton and bridal tribute to this realm. This formality was all foreign to Clark. He discouraged anyone from kneeling to him, yet this poor girl was doing it out of some mandate. He spoke back to her in their common tongue. Hello, Kara. I'm Kalel, and, um, there's really no need to bow. Kara peered up at Superman and slowly stood up again. Taking a breath to speak, Clark glanced behind her and saw the other girls still in shock. If it's all right with you, we'd better go somewhere to talk. Yes, my lord. Okay, um, do you want to say goodbye to your friends? Kara gave a brisk nod, turned around, and gave a big wave to the other girls. The wave almost snapped them out of what they were seeing. Superman and Supergirl turned around and together took off into the sky. The girls did not come out of their trance nor think to photograph the two of them until they were already well into the air. They appeared only as specks in the few photos the girls managed to take. Kara flew along, just behind Clark. When he glanced back at her, she kept her eyes averted from him. It was a short flight from the Danver suburbs to Smallville. They landed at Kent Farm and Clark showed the young lady inside. As they entered the house, he called out to Martha. Hi, Ma. Sorry to surprise you, but we've got an unexpected house guest. Oh my, Clark. Who do we have here? I'm guessing this is my cousin. Cousin? Kara, this is Martha. Welcome to the family, honey. As Martha's affection bubbled over, she immediately took Kara into a full embrace. By the look of it, Kara was taken by surprise from this greeting, though she didn't resist. She let herself be consoled for a moment in the old woman's arms. As the two of them broke apart, Kara looked up at Martha with moist eyes. She spoke with an unusual accent. Thank you. No worries, darling. 
Have you eaten lunch yet? I was about to start cooking. Kara's eyes widened as she looked back and forth between Martha and Clark before venturing an answer. No. Clark wondered how much more English she had picked up. The three of them went to the kitchen. Clark transformed from his radiant self back to the work clothes he had been wearing when he left the Daily Planet. Kara was a little taken aback by Clark's transformation, admiring his suit and tie. The two of them sat at the table while Martha busied herself with cooking. Kara looked around the room, marveling at the wonder of a country kitchen. There was so much Clark wanted to learn from Kara. They continued speaking in their native tongue. Can you tell me where you came from? The moment he spoke, she seemed to cower at his voice, keeping her eyes cast downward as she answered. I am from Argo, my lord. I am the daughter of Zarel. I was chosen to act as bridal tribute and emissary by my father and given to you, my lord. But aren't we cousins? Of course, my lord. My father promised you a cousin. He has kept his word, my lord. I'd prefer you not call me that. I'd rather not lord over anyone if I can help it. You can call me Clark. His last sentence slipped into English, and just as instinctually, Kara replied in English, though she hesitated to begin. Can I ask you a question, Clark? Clark was surprised she had already learned so many words in their syntax. Sure, go right ahead. What has happened to Krypton? This is not the place I expected it to be. What has become of our people? This time, it was Clark who averted his gaze. I'm afraid. I'm the last of us left. Krypton was destroyed and I grew up here on Earth, among its people. Kara's eyes widened. She looked back at Clark with a dawning dread. Then you and I will have to marry at once? Martha looked up from chopping onions, startled from this question. Clark, too, sat back, upright in his chair. He was embarrassed by the proposition alone. Kara was barely a child, and his cousin no less. Oh, oh no, no, no. You and I aren't getting married. This news landed on Kara with a kind of shock that reverberated over her. Her eyes began to well up for a moment. Clark wasn't so sure how to read her expression and did his best to console her. I mean, you're a beautiful young lady, but, you know, just too young for me, that's all. Kara took a deep breath and put a hand over her heart as she exhaled. Oh my, I'm so relieved. When the matter of matrimony was ruled out of the question, Kara finally began to relax. Letting her guard down some, she stopped averting her gaze from Clark as they spoke. He went on to explain to Kara what little he knew about what happened to Krypton. She was remarkably not perturbed by the destruction of the planet. Even she found this reaction unusual. I know I should feel some sense of loss, but I can't seem to find it. I was expecting to be married to a distant cousin and stuffed in some castle, but now, I don't know. Does this mean I can take this crystal off now too? Clark had forgotten about the blue crystal pendant she wore around her neck. It was among his lesser worries that day. Why did you put it on to begin with? It was a part of the instructions they gave me before coming through the gateway I entered through from Argo. I expected a ceremonial reception, but no one was there to greet me except your imp. When he left, I did as I was told and put on the crystal pendant. Martha sat down at the table and served them all a beautiful spread of cooked vegetables and potatoes. Kara's eyes widened at the sight of the food. Martha patted her on the back of her hand. Dig in, honey, but tell us what happened next, after you put on the pendant. I do love a good story with supper. Clark and Martha began casually eating their lunch. Kara, in contrast, tasted her food once before eating it all fervently. When she was finished, she went on to tell the rest of her story. It was such a drain when I first put on the pendant, but I found it didn't take away my ability to fly. That was all I needed. When no one came for me, I flew away. I hoped no one would come looking. Martha put a hand on Kara's shoulder, her eyes full of sorrow. Oh, darling, that sounds so frightening. Where'd you go? I flew along the mountains until I came to a great city. Danvers. There were many people, and I made friends. You couldn't possibly have already learned our language from where you came. Did you learn all this from your friends? Kara smiled with pride. Eyes squinted. She gave an adorable nod to Martha. I did. Did you hear that, Clark? She's a quick study, just like you. Clark smiled back at them both, happy to see Martha and Kara were already forming a rapport. Though he didn't show it, 
Clark was nervous. He knew that Kara, clad in the same colors and wearing the emblem he wore, would stir trouble if Luther were to hear about her. Kara's arrival was the very thing Luther had warned of and campaigned on. Clark was happy not to be the one to explain it to Kara. Martha took the initiative to break down some of the geopolitical tensions at play in the world. She explained Clark's double life as Superman and Clark Kent. In conclusion, she proposed Kara stay on the farm with her for a while, until she managed to get a sense of the world. Yes, I would like that, Martha. With lunch finished, it was decided Kara would have Clark's old room. Standing up from the table, Kara removed the crystal pendant from her neck. As she handed it to Clark, she began to progressively glow until she was too bright for everyone's comfort. She hurried and put the pendant back on, gaining control of her power once more. Clark commented, Maybe you ought to hold on to it a bit longer. That thing taught me to control my powers. I used it to learn how to transform between my two forms, just by thinking of the crystal's frequency. Kara stopped to assess Clark's attire, tilting her head and puzzling her face. Like this? In a blink and a flash, she transformed her clothes into a small business suit matching Clark's. She didn't stop there. Kara transformed her outfit repeatedly throughout the evening as they situated her into the house. She was eager to create a new persona for herself. I will call myself after the marvelous city, Danvers. I will be Kara Danvers. Martha brought in new sheets and bedding that Clark had never seen before and freshened up his old bed for Kara. That sounds wonderful, Kara. Kara Danvers. Just lovely. Kara and Martha had the excitement of two girls at a slumber party. Before it got too late, Clark excused himself. He had been away from the battlefront for several days and needed an update on the situation. Flying directly to Gotham, he sought to get his intel from Bruce. Superman found the Batcave empty. It was not the first time he had visited Batman only to discover that he was away. Yet this time, Clark did not immediately leave. He toured the levels of the cave instead. Within the context of the memories Bruce had shared with him, Many artifacts around the cave took on new meaning. A giant eight-foot penny discreetly stood on its end in one of the shadows of the cave. Clark vaguely remembered it from a memory of how Batman came into possession of this coin. Bruce kept it there as a solemn reminder of his college friend, Harvey Dent, after he'd been transformed into the criminal Two-Face. Clark stopped in front of the giant coin as he reflected on his friend's many hardships. From the upper levels of the cave, Clark heard footsteps descending. Alfred Pennyworth emerged from a nearby staircase, carrying himself with a regal posture that noted his sense of pedigree. Alfred, Bruce Wayne's personal assistant and butler, noticed Superman in the Batcave while making a security check. Bruce had known Alfred his entire life and trusted no one more. Alfred and Clark had shared many brief interactions over the years, but never had the two of them spoken without Bruce. Good evening, sir. Master Bruce is away at the moment. Is there anything I may be able to provide you, sir? No thank you, Alfred. Unless you happen to be up to date on the Kasnian front. Unfortunately, sir, on that account, I am unprepared to offer much counsel at the moment. It's quite all right, Alfred. I wasn't expecting it. Will Bruce be back any time soon? I cannot say, sir. Between the League of Shadows and the legions of escaped criminals he is tracking, it is hard to say where or when he will be off to next. That is not to mention his own personal struggles. I have never seen him more pressed. If you don't mind me asking, how's he doing these days? I don't think he would admit it if you asked, but he has been having quite a bit of friction with young Master Jason. They are having some differences in philosophy as Master Jason comes of age. I believe Master Bruce fears what he sees of himself in the boy. Clark had not spent much time with Jason, beyond the memories Bruce shared with him. Outside of the remorse that Jason had been too inexperienced when he first became Robin, he knew of no tensions between them. Where'd this new conflict come from? Master Bruce has benefited from several relations in recent weeks. Among them has been his appreciation of your personal approach to the world, sir. Wow, that's kind of flattering. I do not mean it to be so, sir. His former disdain of your methods caused him a good deal of strife when Master Richard became enamored by the Justice League. But with this recent change of heart, Master Bruce has left behind a mode of thinking that Master Jason is determined to preserve. It has led to an egregious multitude of quarrels between he and Master Bruce. Uh, I'm so sorry. I feel like that's my fault. No, sir. Not at all. It is something he has needed for a very long time. I can attest. His own need to rebel in these ways as a teenager brought him around the world and back again. It is only fitting, sir, that he should find the most akin apprentices. 
Clark appreciated Alfred's candid confession. After knowing him for a decade, he welcomed the open communication. You know, Alfred, you don't have to call me sir. You can call me Clark. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the invitation. It is an honor, sir. Clark chuckled but did not pursue the subject that night. Bruce did not return before he and Alfred finished their conversation. Regardless, Superman saw Batman the next day at the Hall of Justice when the League was called in for an early morning debriefing. A new alliance had formed. Colonel Steve Trevor broke it down. Basically, all of those that refused to join the Coalition of Nations have entered the war against Kaznia. But under their own banner, the United Sodality. These nations are scattered around the world, mostly in the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. And though they're not working directly with us, it seems they are already dividing Kaznia's attention, even getting most of it at times. Clark glanced up to make eye contact with Batman. From a single nod, his unspoken question was answered. Yes, these nations were all affiliated with Ra's al Ghul in the League of Shadows. This realization filled Clark with a looming sense of dread. Yet this turn in the war, if anything, was a relief for the Justice League. Ra's al Ghul received most of Vandal Savage's attention. The Justice League split up their time between helping refugees and offering their other usual hero duties around the world. While sorting out the logistics of the ever-changing battlefront, Clark never knew when to mention Kara, or who he should mention her to. It seemed like important news to share, yet compared to the scale of problems the Justice League faced each day, his family's living arrangement proved inconsequential. Clark was busy enough in Metropolis and wherever else he was needed. With so much happening on an international scale, Superman's escapades had little effect in the news headlines. Yet Kara, living on Kent Farm, had managed to find every article she could of her cousin's accomplishments. In the last month of summer alone, he had extinguished numerous fires, held together a collapsing bridge as a train barely made it across, evacuated thousands of refugees, and built an entire village for them in a single day. Whenever Clark managed to have dinner at the farm, Kara did all she could to coax more stories out of him. Do you ever go into a day knowing what you will face? Or is it always a surprise? Well, it's mostly always a surprise from one day to the next. But with the refugees, I do get a few days notice from Argus. Though it's not like I have any of this on a scheduled itinerary. Kara wanted to ask another question, but resisted when she saw the stricken expression creeping over Clark's face. It was dawning on him that he had a very important event to attend and had nearly forgotten all about it. Oh no. Lois's wedding. Did I miss it? What day is it today? After a brief panic, Clark reconciled that the wedding was the following day, and though he had managed to calm himself, his energy turned out to be contagious. Kara became enraptured at the idea of attending a wedding with Clark. Wedding movies are my favorite movies. I thought you hated the idea of getting married. No, not at all. I love it when a woman gets to fall in love and be chosen. Those are the best movies. Clark turned to Martha to find an excuse not to take her, but Martha only encouraged it. Oh, Kara, imagine what a beautiful dress you can make, but just be sure not to outshine the bride. There were no arguments for Clark to make as Kara and Martha spent the rest of the night imagining and creating dresses for Kara. The following day, during the wedding ceremony, Clark had a few tears to wipe from his eyes as Lois walked down the aisle, but next to him, Kara wept profusely. During the wedding reception that evening, Lois found Clark on his own. She wore a curious smile on her face as she approached him. You know, Clark, when I told you to bring a date, I didn't think you'd be robbing the cradle. That's my cousin, Kara. She insisted on coming. Your cousin? Clark, how do you have another cousin? And why didn't you mention her before? After explaining it all to Lois, she laughed, realizing this was the same girl she had warned Jimmy not to pursue. With serendipitous timing, Kara found Clark talking to the bride. You must be Lois. You are so beautiful. I love your dress. And you must be Kara. Thank you. I love your dress too. Really? I designed it myself. My, my, look at you. And I love this party. I never knew a party could be fun. This music is incredible. Thanks. I thought it was pretty standard DJ material, but yeah. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? It is! And it is amazing how it makes your body move. Oh, you are the most adorable thing. Clark, I'm just gonna have to steal her for a bit. Lois swept Kara away and into the party. 
Clark was left to hover around the edges of the dance floor, worrying over whatever his next call to action might be. Later that night, Jimmy saddled up next to Clark, flush red from dancing. Wow, Clark, your cousin is something else. Isn't she a bit young for you, Jimmy? Oh yeah, I've got a girlfriend anyway. Have you met Linda? We both agree, Kara's the life of the party. She's hilarious and a great dancer. You should get out there, Clark. Go shake your butt. Clark looked out on the dance floor and saw everyone enjoying themselves. He had never danced before and hoped it could still be avoided. Thanks for the encouragement, bud. But I've never been much of a dancer, actually. What? Nonsense. Dancing is just walking in place, but you do it to the music. Like this. Jimmy strutted away to the time of the beat as he shuffled back onto the dance floor. Not surprisingly, his girlfriend Linda looked a lot like Kara. Clark was pleased that not once that evening was he called away to be Superman. Allowed to remain for the festivities, he stayed as the party persisted into the night. Though eventually, when Clark went looking for Kara, no one had seen her for some time. With a final congratulations to the bride and groom, Clark said goodnight to Lois and Richard before dashing off to find his cousin. Kara was nowhere to be found. Clark was getting worried. With hesitance, Clark telepathically contacted Jean Jones. Before that night, Martha had been the only one who knew about Kara. Clark had no doubt that this was another secret Martha would have discouraged him from keeping from his friends. Within moments, Jean Jones had contacted Mr. Terrific and learned of an altercation underway at a county fair near Danvers City. Clark immediately flew to it before anyone else was hurt. Superman arrived at a neon-lit park, finding it in tatters. At its center, several carnival rides lay wrecked on the ground. Nearby them, Kara battled local police as they pummeled her with an arsenal of military surplus. She had transformed into a cape, skirt, and fashionable top, all red and blue and emblazoned with their family crest. The bullets didn't hurt her, but she kept her head down and her arms up in defense. Clark swooped in and landed next to her. She was crying and confused when he first arrived. She didn't hesitate to take cover behind him. Normally, Superman's presence alone was enough to set the police at ease. They rarely wasted their ammunition once he was on the scene. Yet this time, the officers continued firing on them as he consoled his poor cousin. Even when Clark turned around to let them know that everything was alright, they continued to increase the caliber of their weapons. As far as these police were concerned, their attackers wore the same insignia. When communication proved futile, Clark cradled Kara in his arms and flew her back to the farm. After Kara cried to Clark and Martha for some time, she tried her best to explain herself. She had left the party on an impulse to go flying through the air. I thought it would be fun to see Danvers all sparkling and glowing at night. But along the way, I saw this beautiful, colorful place full of people and little buildings. Martha stopped patting Kara for just a moment as she puzzled her face. What kind of place are we talking about? Clark leaned in to clarify. It was a county fair, Ma. Oh, oh dear. Kara went on, fighting back tears as she spoke. So, I approached the... She looked at Clark in the eyes and slowly spoke the phrase to be sure she heard it correctly. County Fair. And I heard people screaming. I found them being thrown around by some kind of machine. I tried to break the carriage free to save them. But the giant arms it swung by fell into another machine that was spinning around in circles. And then it turned out the machine was full of people and they all came flying out when it came to a halt. Kara fell back into sobs. Martha's face was astonished. She could have never imagined Kara going to a wedding would have turned out this poorly. When the young lady recovered herself, she went on telling her story. I tried to help the people, but they ran away from me screaming. And... Soon there were men yelling at me and pointing their guns. I... I yelled at them to stop. And I don't know what happened. I somehow pushed them all back. All of them, along with their cars and several of the little buildings and all of the lights on them. Again, Kara broke off into crying and had to tell the rest of the story through tears. Then, more men arrived. But they just started yelling and shooting at me. And then Clark came and saved me. I'm so sorry, Clark. I shouldn't have left you. Kara collapsed her face into the kitchen table until Martha joined her in the crying. It's all my fault, Kara. Clark tried to tell me, 
but I wanted you to have a night out. A wedding seemed like so nice, and I didn't want you to be left at home when your cousin went to a party. Martha went on crying for a moment, though her tears shook Kara from her sorrows. She consoled Martha instead. After a few minutes, the two of them were comforting each other, assuring themselves that it would be all right. Clark hoped so, but he was not so sure. He had seen the wreckage, and had no doubt that by now, Lex Luthor had seen it too. Thank you for listening. I'm Isaac Bluefoot. The novella is written and produced by myself. I love telling the story and hope you're enjoying it. To ensure Season 3 gets completed in a timely manner, there are so many things you can do to support this show. Talk about it, recommend it to friends, rate and review the show wherever you can, and most especially, become a patron at patreon.com slash bluefoot. If you have a pittance to spare, I could really use it in my storytelling pursuits. I really appreciate it. This story was inspired by the Superman and DC Comics and Characters originally created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, with additional contributions by Joseph Samuelson, Joe Serta, Dennis O'Neill, Neil Adams, Robert Kaniger, Carmine Infantino, John Broom, Ira Yarbrow, Otto Binder, Al Plastino, Bill Finger, Bob Kane, Don Cameron, Jerry Conway, Don Newton, William Moulton Marston, Harry G. Peter, and Julius Schwartz. Manuscript editing assistance by Trisha Reel. Music in this episode was made by Vortex, Blue Dot Sessions, Jody Piconin, Poddington Bear, Kai Engel, Oscar Schuster, Sergei Quadrado, and Ryan Anderson. See the episode notes for details. For more of my work, get yourself a deck of Omen Quest cards at omenquestcards.com. It's hard to describe how amazing these games can be. And be sure to listen to the next episode, Chapter 28, Public Enemy. <laughs>